Welcome everyone, I'm Joanne Kamins, Executive Director of Agene, and I'm here today to bring you part three of our Peer Mentoring Masterclass, Mentoring Best Practices. The mentoring practices that I'm going to talk about today will apply both to your peer mentoring groups and to any other sort of uh, regular mentoring relationships that you have uh, in your life, in your workplace, uh, wherever that you are working with a mentor. So hopefully you have formed a peer mentoring group based on parts one and two of this series, or at least you're thinking about it. Now what? We have a group, we have a topic, um, how do we go forward? So I'm just going today to present a few of the best practices that you can use over a long time whenever you're involved in a mentoring um, experience. We're going to talk about four best practices. The first is about asking questions. The second is about um, looking for opportunities for growth setting concrete goals, and finally, how to use content in your groups and why to use content um, to help steer your discussions and focus your learning. My first mentoring best practices is a little counterintuitive. People think that mentors are there to give advice and answer your questions, but really the best mentors actually ask good questions. And if you think about it, uh, the mentors that have been the best ones in your life and gotten the most uh, development of you and thinking about yourself are the ones that have asked you really good and deep questions that made you think. And that's true of your friends, of your peers, and other senior people to you as well. So mentors should be disciplining themselves not to jump in with answers. In the talking out of their problems and their dilemmas, it's how they're going to come to the best solutions. So one fun thing to think about is not to ask yes or no questions. High gain questions are questions that do not have a yes or no answer. As opposed to saying, how did your talk go today? You might say, what went well about your talk? And what could have been better about your talk? What would you do differently next time? And actually, one of the best things you can say is, tell me more about that. So actually, I talk too much, so um, I'm a very bad phone interviewer. Because when you interview people on the phone, you really need to make space for them to speak. And I actually had a mentor teach me how to do better phone interviews. And he told me the only thing I was allowed to say after a few introductory questions was, ah, tell me more about that. And this actually works like a charm. Um, so think about asking those high gain questions, those statements that elicit thinking uh, from the person that is struggling with the dilemma. Um, and in fact, you can spend a whole mentoring group and make it a rule that no one asks a yes or no question. We only ask high gain questions here, uh, which would be a fun exercise and a great management and leadership tool as well. Another really important thing that happens in a mentoring setting is feedback. Uh, you know, uh, how something was, how it went, what went well. And I actually just heard a, a really great speaker talking about how um, she coaches Olympic athletes. And they're so good that every little bit of advice that can shave a minute, a second off their time or make them go one inch higher, they appreciate it. And they see feedback as an opportunity not as feedback. And so I'm really trying to replace feedback with opportunities in all of my coaching and mentoring and in any of my management, because that's really how a great way to see it. And I'm actually even trying to see it that way for myself. When someone makes a suggestion, I'm like, it's an opportunity to do something differently or better. So thinking about feedback in that way and doing it regularly, practicing feedback, um, a great thing for a mentoring group to do is to practice giving one another opportunities for improvement. Um, and that is authentic assistance for growth. And if you can hear that and internalize it, it doesn't mean you have to do everything that people suggest or you have to agree with it, but at least showing that you hear it, that's gonna make you a better mentee and help you get more from the relationship. You really wanna focus on specific issues and not the person themselves. It's not like you're a bad speaker, it's like, hey, I think this talk might have gone better if it had a section before section two that introduced the topic. Um, and then everyone can think about that without feeling personally threatened. Um, you also want to praise people when something goes well. Positive, uh, positive reinforcement is a huge part of, of, uh, re of realizing a task and successfully completing it. Avoid assumptions. So asking those high gain questions is another good part of, of giving, um, pointing out things that can be done differently or changing because questions can lead to the person to come to their own conclusions about what might need to be changed or improved. And as far as being a good mentee, you have to be ready for that feedback. Um, I once had coffee with someone who was connected to me 
And after 15 minutes, I had made four suggestions and that person had actually, to all of my suggestions, had said, yeah, you know, networking, I don't really have time for that. Improve my LinkedIn profile. I don't like social media. Um, you know, I want to be a project manager. Oh, that needs a special certification. That's not what I think it is. Uh, you know, that's what I'm good at. That's what I'm going to do. So after 15 minutes, we were pretty done. I had given her all my best advice for what to do next. And, and, and they had, these ideas had been rejected. So frankly, even if you don't agree with all of the advice, you're going to get a lot more good advice if you at least say, I will consider that. Um, now, I'm a much better talker than I am a listener, so I really admire people who are good listeners um, and, and take to heart the suggestions that people make. This is a great thing to work on with your groups as a skill. Mentoring groups, I find if they just sit around and talk, and, and really, as you get to know each other, you could sit around for two, three hours and just talk, and that could be fun, um, especially if you often do your group over drinks, and by the third drink, everyone is really just like ready to chat. Um, and and um, the better you get to know each other, the easier that's going to be. But that's really not going to drive the change that you're looking to see. So the first part of your meeting can be about catching up and how everyone's doing, but then bring content into your into your groups. For most of my mentoring groups, I really demand homework. So right now, the mentoring group I'm involved in are writing their own recommendation letters. And um, we are going to read each other's recommendation letters in advance and make sure that they are praiseworthy enough and show the right amount of self-confidence and self-definition um, that a recommendation letter would need to have. So we want people to really own their success and their strengths. So that's an activity that we're doing now to spur our uh, development, our discussion, and our honest uh, evaluation of our own skills. Um, so you may want to use uh, resources like that and tools and tricks and other ways of um, bringing content and enrichment to your meetings. So here's one of my favorite ones that I thought I would just give as an example. So people are very good at making binary decisions. If I say to you chocolate or vanilla, you know right away which one is your favorite. But if I ask you what your favorite meal is, it might take you a little while to kind of narrow it down. Um, even if I said to you, what's the most important thing you have to do today? You might have trouble with that. But if I said, uh, is it make dinner or finish this talk that I have to give tonight? For sure, the latter one would win and we would have fish sticks from the freezer again, right? So um, binary decisions are easy. Ranking things is difficult. So I love to use forced choice analysis, which involves binary decisions to help uh, reveal things about people's really uh, strengths, weaknesses, thoughts, and goals and desires in my mentoring groups. So here's how forced choice analysis works. Uh, you, let's say you wrote down five things you needed to get done this week and you number them one to five, and then you compare each item pairwise to every other item in the list. I think you can figure this out. You're a bunch of technical people. One to two, one to three, one to four, one to five. You start over two to three, two to four, two to five, until everything has been pairwise compared. And then each time you compare them, you say, which one is more important? Preparing my talk or arranging the booth for World CRISPR Day? Which one is more time sensitive? And the one that wins gets a mark. And then when you add up the marks, the ones with more marks are more important. So here's one that I did on a real day in my life, uh, probably about 10 years ago. Um, and you can see how it fell out. Um, again, fish sticks for dinner. My kids had those fairly often uh, when I was really busy with work. My parents probably did not get a phone call until the weekend. I did get my talk ready. I did talk to the collaborator because when someone else is waiting, that's often the most important task. Uh, I did get back to the lawyer. So when you're working in a biotech, if the legal team wants something, you have to hop to it. So those are the things that got done first. They were more important on this particular day. But what if I ranked them a different way? And what if your people in your mentoring circle ranked them a different way? What was more fun? Because wouldn't you like to have a job 10 years from now that's more fun? And so, oh, I like public speaking. That super works for me, right? Um, and so I'm in a job now where I get to do a lot of that. I really like collaborating on projects. Um, still did not call my parents, still did not make dinner, but I definitely did not call a lawyer. So legal documents are not my thing. I am not bound to be in tech transfer or an IP lawyer. Thank goodness I have other people to do that at Agene. Um, and they were super important before, but they weren't the things that rose to the top because they're not the most fun things for me. In fact, I tried to take Legal Studies 1 as an undergraduate and fell asleep and had to drop the class so that I didn't fail. So um, this can really uncover what it is that you like. 
But what if you did this again and what were you great at? So combining the things that you like and you're great at can be a fantastic place to think about the skills you want to be using in your next position or in your career or in your job in the future, because that's a really fun place to be. I get to do a lot of public speaking. I'm pretty good at it. That really goes well for my career now because I get to do that a lot. So um, forced choice analysis can be done in many, many ways, and um, we'll provide the content for that and links from the video so that you'll be able to do it yourself. Another mentoring best practice is setting actual goals. I know this sometimes seems hokey and it's hard to do, but there's nothing to make you learn something and bring that accountability than setting actual SMART goals, specific time-bound goals. And some groups do this early in their experience and then work every month at checking in on how people are doing on their goals. You can do development plans by breaking goals down into their steps, and so you can try and do one step along the way, uh, you know, every two months, every three months. It's great to share these publicly. By telling someone your goals, you help them hold you accountable and help them give you advice and suggestions for how you might execute on those goals. So some groups do that in on paper, in a notebook, uh, shared Google Docs, maybe Evernote, whatever it is that you're using to share your content. Um, you know, using goal setting as part of your mentoring experience can be extremely productive and beneficial. A mentoring group or a formal mentoring relationship, it's not meant to be a replacement for a management issue or a good dialogue between your supervisor or your PI. Um, those are problems you have to kind of solve with them. You certainly can discuss with your mentoring group some of those struggles um, and some tactics for addressing them, but um, it's not a replacement for those important conversations in your work life. It's never a guarantee of a promise or a favor. So no one in your group is owing you anything except committing to the group, to showing up and being honest and, and, and kind and working as a group together. It doesn't mean that anyone on the group is going to get you a job or do you a favor or any mentor will do that. So you can't guarantee. So don't take a mentoring relationship and assume that the mentor is going to do those favors for you. It's not for that. You can join or create a peer mentoring group Setting up formal mentoring group programs within your organization can be an enormous favor that you give to your colleagues. Uh, many of the postdoc associations and the, the uh, even graduate organizations here in Boston now have peer mentoring um, programs that they help organize. Um, and I'm always happy to consult and help you do this. Um, there are a lot of things that you can do to make a program successful, and I urge you to look into what makes programs successful before you try and launch your own to, to get the most possible benefit so that everyone in the program benefits. It's an enormous uh, leadership opportunity as well, and uh, one, a great way to meet people. So there are all kinds of good things about being on the organizing end of a peer mentoring program. So thank you for joining us for um, the Peer Mentoring Masterclass. And uh, we look forward to seeing how you use this tactic in your learning going forward into the future.